Hey everyone, uh, we're back to do some more pre-calculus and we're looking at chapter 1.5, which is a great chapter because it is going to be about inverse functions, which is a very important thing to learn how to do. People get freaked out by these initially until you learn the Sheverton secret on how to do these so they're easy. They have a process, and as long as you follow the process, you're gonna find they're easy. So let me get a blank page. <clears throat> okay, so inverse functions. So first let's talk about what an inverse function is, and you already know. First of all, square root of x, we could write this as x to the one half, right? Cube root of x, you could also write that as x to the one third. Fourth root of x, you could write that as x to the one fourth, and dot, 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 dot. A one half, one third, one fourth means you're taking a root of some kind. So two to the one third power, oops, sorry, not two to the one third, that'd be really hard. Eight to the one third power, meaning cube root of eight. Well, eight is two cubed. So the cube root of eight is just gonna give me two because it's what number is multiplied three times to give you eight? Well, the answer is two. So just wanna remind you of these because this is gonna be illustrative for how we're going to understand how these inverse functions work. And so if I think about, oh, first of all, the other thing, uh, x squared raised to the fifth power. How do you raise an exponent to the exponent? Do you add these together or do you multiply? Yes, you multiply. This is gonna be x to the two times five. That's gonna be x to the 10th power. When you raise an exponent to an exponent, you multiply. That's our algebraic rule we gotta always remember. So don't forget. Yeah, even you, don't forget. Okay, so now let's do another one. Let's take square root of x and let's raise it to an exponent. Now, when you see this, this looks fairly ugly, right? Radical x squared? Oh my God, what are we gonna do? And you are gonna learn that I encourage you whenever you see a square root sign to change it to x to the one half because it's always easier to deal with. If it's a cube root, change it to x to the one third. It's always easier to deal with when you do that. Now, let's apply our rule. What do you do when you raise an exponent to an exponent? Well, that would be one half times two and one half times two is one. Wait a minute. Wait, let's, let's do another test. Cube root of x raised to the third power. Well, that would be x to the one third cubed. When you raise an exponent to an exponent, you multiply. I heard somebody say that once. So that'd be one third times three. Holy mackerel, one third times three is also one. I bet that's gonna work for the fourth root and the fifth root and the sixth root. And so what happens is we took the square root function and we operated on it with the squaring function. And these two functions are inverses of each other. And whenever you operate on a function with its inverse, you always just get the argument that was in the original function. Let me make a fancy color here. So we ended up with just the thing that was in here. And likewise here, we got the same thing because I did the cube root was acted on by the cubing function. And so they undid each other and you just get the thing inside the function X. This is the property of inverse functions. Whenever you have an inverse function inside the original function or the other way around, they're gonna wipe each other out. Now, recall, if I have F of X equals X squared, and g of x equals x over seven plus, I don't know, four. And I said, what would 
f of g of x be? We did this last unit. I would plug g of x into x. So this would be x over 7 plus 4 squared. And if I did g of f of x, I would plug f of x here into g wherever I see an x. And I only see an x on the numerator. So it would be x squared over 7 plus 4. These were composite functions. And the reason why we learned composite functions is so we can use them on inverse functions. And let me show you how these get used. Here's the rule for inverse function. If I have a function f of x, I would write its inverse function as f to the minus 1 of x. This does not mean 1 over f of x. If I wanted to write 1 over f of x, I would write f of x to the minus 1 power. These mean the same thing. The minus 1 here between the f and the x means inverse. And what did I say on the previous page when I did the square root of x and I put it inside the squaring function? So for example, f of x was x squared and g of x was square root of x. If I did f of g of x, I'd plug g of x into f. Oh, there's g of x, I'll plug it into f. So I'd get square root of x squared. And what did this become? Oh yeah, x, because the one half times the two canceled each other out in the exponents. And likewise, if I did g of f of x, let's see, I'd put f of x inside g. So f of x is x squared. I'm going to put it inside g. So I'd get that. And what's the square root of x squared? Yep, you got it. It's x. So notice the composite of these functions gave me x. And when I composited them the other way, they still gave me x. This is the definition of something being an inverse. If g of x, when you plug it into x, gives you x like this, it's going to be an inverse. If f of f inverse, if I put the inverse function inside the original function, I'm always going to get x. Or if I take the inverse function, and I stick the original function in it, I'm also going to get x. This is how you prove that something is an inverse of itself. This is how we verify that x squared and square root of x are inverses of each other, is because when we do the composite both ways, got to do it both ways, though many times I'm lazy and I only do it one, but you got to do it both ways then if I get x in both cases, then it shows that it's an inverse. Okay, so let's try to calculate an inverse function. And if I have f of x equals, what is it, x squared plus one. And I want to find the inverse function. Because what's more fun than finding the inverse function? You know what I mean? Okay, here's the steps. Number one, write it as, as y equals whatever. So in this case, I would do y equals, there we go y equals x squared plus one, okay? Step two, switch x and y. Okay, I can do that. x equals, oops, y squared plus one. I switched x and y. Okay, step three. 
solve for y. Okay, so I'm going to solve for y, so I'm going to get y on one side, everything on the other. x minus 1 equals y squared. And then to solve for y, I'm going to take a square root of both sides. So y equals square root of x minus 1. Okay. Ta-da! Now, last step four, test. So see if, if this is the inverse, as I claim, I claim that we just did this process, so this must be the inverse function of x. If that is true, then f of f inverse, the composite, should give me x. And the inverse function of f of x, the other composite, should also give me x. So let's see. So if I test it, if I do the first one, f of f inverse, that's going to be, I'm going to plug the inverse function into f. So I'm going to get square root of x minus 1 squared plus 1. I plugged square root of x minus 1 into x here. And the square and the square root, that's just going to become x minus 1 plus 1. Oh, equals x. Ding, 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 ding. Now the other way. f inverse of f of x. So I'm going to plug x into the inverse function. So here's my inverse function. And instead of x, I'm going to put x squared plus 1. Oh, don't forget the minus 1 that's sitting there. So here's my x minus 1. Oh, wait. Plus 1, minus 1, those are going to cancel. So I'll get square root of x squared and square root of x squared. Oh, ding, 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 ding. That equals x as well. So this means since both of the composites gave me the argument x, the, variable, the individual variable, then this is the inverse of that. And that's all there is to it. You go through these steps. I would recommend you write down these steps so you always have them to look at. If you always follow those steps, every problem will look the same. And that's key in pre-calculus and in any math class because everything we do in math is patterns. And if you can remember the patterns, you can do any problem and all the problems look the same to you. Okay, so this one is a particularly inconvenient one, but we'll do it anyways. That's not terrible. Okay, we want to find the inverse function of this. So step one, write it as y equals something. Step two, switch x and y. Step three, solve for y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by y plus two. It'll cancel on this side, but I'll get a y plus two on this side. Okay. Now I'm going to multiply out. This is where people get stuck. I'm going to distribute. Now I want to get all the y's on one side and all the x's on the other, right? So I'm going to move this to the other side. So I'm going to minus xy. And I'm going to do a minus 3 at the same time as well to move the 3 over here. So let me get rid of this here. Oh, wait. Let me use my fancy-dancy lasso. Lasso! Okay, so now I'm going to get 
2x minus 3 equals y minus xy. So this is the trick with these kind of problems. You distribute the xy. It doesn't make sense, but you'll move this to the other side of the equation. And now you factor. This is a step people forget. So you want to make this example very clear in your notes. So I'll factor this, I'll pull a y out, and I'll have 1 minus x left over. Now what do I do to solve for y? Right, I am going to divide by 1 minus x. So I'll get 2x minus 3 over 1 minus x equals y. So I claim this is the inverse, okay? Well, I gotta test it. So now I gotta go to, okay? I'm gonna do F, so I claim this is F inverse. And if I did the algebra right, it should work. So F inverse, so that thing is gonna go into X. Now here's where it gets really inconvenient. So this is gonna be, I have to put inside each of these, this fraction. So 2x minus three over one minus x plus three over 2x minus three over one minus x plus two. Now you're looking at this and you're thinking, holy crap, what do I do about this one minus X? And you're probably thinking, I don't like that there. In fact, I don't like it at all. Well, if you don't like it at all, I'm a fan of getting rid of denominators. I'm going to multiply the numerator by one minus X and I'm going to multiply the denominator by one minus X. And what happens when this multiplies into that one? Exactly. These are going to cancel, but don't forget, I also get one here. So I'm going to get here 2x minus 3 plus 3 times 1 minus x over 2x minus 3 plus I'll get one here. But the, this denominator cancels when I multiplied by this, by 1 minus x. Now, I know some of you are going to think, I don't really understand this algebra. This is why you should come to office hours. I'll do more example problems about this so you can see. Okay. So now let's multiply out the numerator. This will be 2x minus 3 plus 3 minus 3x over 2x minus 3 plus 2 minus 2x. Okay, these will cancel. These will cancel. Notice I use my graphical method to show what is canceling what. I use these diagonal arrows to show that they cancel out. So I'm going to get 2x minus 3x. I'm going to get minus x. Minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1. Ding, ding, ding. It works. Okay, let's try it the other way. So that's x. Okay, so now I'm going to do f inverse of f of x. You're probably thinking this will be easier. Yeah, I don't think it is. So f inverse, what was it? It was this. So f a, I erased it, sorry. It was 2x minus 3 over 1 minus x. Okay, yeah. Probably shouldn't have erased that. Not your best idea. Okay, so I'm going to put this into x here and here. So f inverse of f of x. So f of x is going inside f inverse. So 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 2 minus 3 
over one minus x plus three over x plus two. So there was an x here, right there. I replaced it with f, and there was an x here. I replaced it with f. And again, you're thinking, holy crap, why do we have to have fractions and fractions? Well, if you don't like it, do something about it. Don't just erase it. No, that's bad. Use math. Math is your friend. So I'm going to multiply by x plus 2. When I multiply here, sure, I'm going to get 3 times x plus 2. But when I multiply here, the x plus 2s are going to cancel. Likewise, I'll get a term there, but here they're going to cancel. So I'll end up with a 2 here. And here I'm just going to end up with x plus 3. Come on. Computer's a little laggy. Minus, here's where people make a mistake. They forget to add the thing they're multiplying into this constant. That's the most common mistake when you're doing this test. When you have something like this, a fraction with x in the numerator and denominator. So you always got to remember, always, always, always got to remember, you got to do this distribution and this one. Those are the ones that people tend to forget because they're so focused on the denominator. Okay, I'll get an x plus 2 here minus, these are going to cancel, and let me show you another mistake people make. They go x plus 3. But that's wrong. The negative is going into this whole thing. So this has to be in parentheses because that negative is going to get distributed to the 3. Algebra. Yes. So 2x plus 3 minus 3x minus 2 over x plus 2 minus x minus 3. Okay, now I got to make some room. Haven't figured out how to resize the page here, but that's okay. So over here, so this is f inverse of f of x. So 2x minus 3x is minus x. Um, oh, this should be a 6, and this should be a 6, right? I did that on purpose to see if you would notice, and you all failed. Bad Sienna student. Bad. Did I mess it up in the bottom? Nope, I didn't. Okay. Because I could see <laughs> things aren't going to cancel. So this will be a plus 6, and this will be a minus 6. And so those are going to cancel. Right? That's better. And now in the denominator, x is going to cancel with minus x. I'm going to have a 2 minus 3. And so this is going to end up with minus x over minus 1, which is x. Check. So this is the process for doing the inverse function. It's kind of laborious, a little bit sometimes, especially when these are the worst ones is when they're a fraction. Um, let's do one more. They're not any funds if they're squares, but they're easy peasy lemon squeezy if they're a linear function so we want to find the inverse function so i encourage you to pause it and try this on your own okay ready go okay step one y equals 2x plus 5. step two x equals 2y plus 5. Step three, I'll subtract five. X minus five equals two Y. Y equals two Y, oops, equals, what am I doing? X minus five over two. Okay, I claim this is the inverse function. 
So now we test f uh, f inverse. I'm going to put this inside this function. So I'm going to have 2 times x minus 5 over 2 plus 5. The 2s will cancel. So I'll have x minus 5 plus 5 whole mackerel. These will cancel, and we get x. Awesome. OK, f inverse of f of x equals, so I'm going to take f of x and plug it into f inverse. So that'll be 2x. There's my x. Oh, yeah, minus 5 over 2. So the parentheses don't matter. I just did that so you can see where I was substituting. Whoop, wrong one. There we go. So I don't really need those. Erase. So plus 5 and minus 5 are going to cancel. So I just have 2x over 2, which, as some of you are aware, is x. So it works. The inverse function is, what do we get over here? x minus 5 over 2. That's the inverse of this. OK? This is relatively straightforward. You just got to do the homework problems and practice the different types. Um, there's only a handful of types. And try those and see how you do. And again, during office hours, I'll be available to answer questions. And I will also solve some example problems for you so you can see the patterns. If you learn the patterns, all the problems look the same. Learn the patterns. Okay. Uh, let me stop sharing and say goodbye.